Good morning, Coach Slack here once again, uh, continuing our readings <clears throat> on the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. On this, which is day 10, uh, continuing homily 2 on page 123. <clears throat> Without harsh tribulations of the flesh, it is difficult for untrained youth to be held under the yoke of sanctification. The beginning of the darkening of the mind once a sign of it is visible in the soul, is to be seen, first of all, in slothfulness with regard to the church services and prayer. For except the soul first fall away from these, she cannot be led in the way of error. But as soon as she is deprived of God's help, she easily falls into the hands of her adversaries. And again, whenever the soul becomes heedless of the labors of virtue, she is inevitably drawn to what is opposed to them. A transition from whichever side it occurs is the beginning of what belongs to the opposite quarter. Practice the work of virtue in your soul and do not concern yourself with futile matters. Always lay bare your weakness before God and you will never be put to the test by aliens when you are found alone, distant from your helper. The activity of taking up the cross is twofold in conformity with the duality of our nature, which is divided into two parts. The first is patient endurance of the tribulations of the flesh, which is accomplished by the activity of the soul's insensitive part, and this is called righteous activity, praxis. The second is to be found in the subtle workings of the understanding, in steady divine meditation, in unfailing constancy of prayer, and in other such practices, the second activity is carried out through the appetitive part of the soul and is called divine vision, theoria. As for the first, that is praxis, it purifies the passionate part of the soul by the power of zeal. And the second, through the action of the soul's love, which is natural yearning, thoroughly filters out the noetic part of the soul. Thus every man who, before training completely in the first part, proceeds to that second activity out of passionate longing for its sweetness, or rather, should I say, out of sloth, has wrath come upon it. Because he did not first mortify his members which are upon the earth, that is, heal the infirmity of his thoughts by patient endurance of the labor which belongs to the shame of the cross. For he dared to imagine in his mind the cross's glory, and this is what was said by holy men of old. If the mind should wish to mount upon the cross before the senses have found rest from their infirmity, the wrath of God comes upon it. Wow, that last paragraph was, uh, was a mouthful. Appetitive, you know, uh, dealing with the appetites. Anyhow, uh, that first sentence, without harsh tribulations of the flesh, it is difficult for untrained youth to be held under the yoke of sanctification. Uh, you know, what I'm seeing here is uh, dealing with, you know, oftentimes people will say or ask, um, you know, if, if, if God is so loving, why does he allow uh, disease and all these sad and, and you know, the uh, things that happen on the earth, her, you know, natural disasters and death and disease and sadness and all these things, why does he allow that to exist? And I think uh, St. Isaac's touching on that. You know, it's like if everything were perfect and easy, uh, you know, who would even think about God or focus on God or, or realize the need for a relationship with God? And even in our own lives where death, disease, and all these disasters do occur, we still find ourselves uh, falling away from uh, what is truly important, you know, um, you know, loving God and loving our fellow man, you know, it happens to us so easily. As soon as we're feeling good or things are going good or, you know, we come into some money or some good times, boom, you know, uh, we're, we're filled with the distractions of life and that's what we're focused on. So, you know, God in his love for us has allowed uh, the tribulations of the flesh, uh, the worldly tribulations to make us remember uh, our need and dependency upon our creator. And then the next uh, couple lines, when he's talking about slothfulness in regard to church services and prayer, um, I believe there's a canon written that says something like, um, once you've missed three consecutive uh, liturgies, then you're basically out of the church. 
And I don't think this canon was written uh, so much to punish us as it was to protect us because, um, you know, it is very important for us to, to utilize what the church gives us, the mysteries of the church, uh, you know, also called the sacraments, you know, confession, communion, um, holy unction, matrimony, baptism, chrismation, all these types of things uh, to, to aid in our healing and our, in our uh, to allow us to, to find that love of God and to participate in it more fully and to thereby love our family, you know, to be able to go back out into the world. Every time when I leave church on Sunday, it's like, okay, now I'm recharged, I'm refreshed to uh, go back out into the world and, and to uh, hopefully do God's will on a daily basis. And that's week to week. And then I do my pilgrimages to the, the to the monasteries, and you know I try annually to go to Mount Athos, and uh, that's like a super recharger, you know, kind of shutting off of the distractions of the world, uh, delving deeply into uh, the lives of the ascetics and the and the, the uh, monastics um, to kind of recharge, refocus um, uh, on a multi multiplied level to go back out into the world for the next year. And then uh, as he continues that paragraph, he's talking about uh, whenever you become heedless of the labors of uh, vir virtue, you're inevitably drawn to what is opposed to them. Transition, whatever side occurs, is the beginning of what belongs to the opposite quarter. So everything's got like an antithesis uh, or an opposite, um, you know, north, south on the uh, magnetic poles. Uh, in this case, we're talking about virtue, so we're talking vices. You know, so if we're not working on our virtue, then inevitably we are participating in our vices. Uh, and vices, as I've read, is nothing more than the uh, overuse or underuse, the misuse of the virtues. So it's like a natural occurrence that, um, you know, we really can never escape. And that if uh, we're, we're not participating in the vices, then we must be participating in the virtues and the opposite being true. And then always lay bare your weakness before God, and you will never be put to the test by aliens when you are found alone distant from the helper. Again, participating in prayer um, and in the church services. And, and also he's distinguishing here, and it's in the footnotes, um, you know, the services are definitely distinct from solitary prayer. Because some people say, well, I read the Bible, I pray on my own, what need do I have to go to church? Um, and we cannot participate in the mysteries. You know, uh, God waits for the ordained priest, uh, lips and hands, as I've heard it said before, to uh, give the sermon and to distribute uh, communion. And so we can't do this alone. Uh, we certainly should continue to pray alone and read scripture alone, but we should also participate in the mysteries of the church by actively going um, to the church. And then that last... Um, paragraph like i said was a, a a mouthful but he's talking about the duality of our our existence um you know living in the world uh your our body and our soul um but one thing at the end here when they're talking about people who thus every man who before training completing the first part proceeds to that second activity our passionate longing for its sweetness has wrath come upon it so this reminds me of a lesson I was given by my spiritual father once that, and I believe it, well, I know it comes from scripture, that first, you know, like steak, for instance, you know, as a grown man, an athlete, a person who works, uh, you know, outdoors a lot, you know, a steak is obviously something that can nourish my body, give me strength. But if we gave that same steak to a baby, it would obviously uh, choke it and, and possibly uh, lead to death. Um, so we first give baby milk and then maybe some crushed up vegetables, eventually some soft food. And then as uh, our bodies grow and um, become, they can take on more, you know, namely the steak in this case. But when we're talking with the spiritual gifts and reading scripture and kind of ascending uh, to theoria, as he mentions here, from praxis, from just righteous activity, um, you know, first God is going to give us baby food. Um, you know, we can't just jump right to theoria because we're not prepared for that yet. We haven't, as he says here, um, because he did not first mortify his members, which are upon the earth. So, you know, if we haven't, 
uh, spent a, a large amount of time, you know, over, you know, basically developing self-control um, over our body, you know, our appetites, uh, appetitive uh, as a part of our soul here. Then, you know, if um, we find moments of grace and these blessings and then we commit, you know, we return, as the scripture says, as a dog to its own vomit, to our old sins, um, you know, the punishment upon ourself um, and the wrath of God upon us seems so much harsher because now we're more responsible. You know, it's kind of like when we make mistakes as a kid, it's like, OK, you're still learning, you know, you're forgiven. But when you're an adult, you shouldn't be making these mistakes because you should have already learned your lessons. Right. Same thing in our spiritual development. You know, we don't want to move on to the next steps until we first mastered ourselves you know namely our body and then when we master our thoughts and then we can begin to even have a vision of mastering our soul you know so but anyhow these are some of the things uh very deep page here as always but in the name of the father son and holy spirit have a great day